you have your Bibles, I hope that you do, you can turn or scroll to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 13 today as we finish up this chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, if you were with us, you remember that we met a very interesting character in the story of Jesus whose name was John the Baptist, and we got to hear the message that God had called him to proclaim to the Jewish people. He was in the Judean wilderness declaring to anybody who would listen to him that they needed to repent and be baptized because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. They needed to prepare themselves because everything that God had promised to them was being fulfilled in the coming of a king whose name was Jesus. And then, incredibly, we saw people hearing the message of John and not letting the message fall on deaf ears, but they began to respond. They they confessed their sin. They confessed their unholiness. They confessed all the ways that they had not pleased God or lived up to his righteous standard, and then they were baptized. And if you've been reading the Bible, if if you grew up in this time, that should surprise you. But there were Jewish people who were being baptized. You see, Jewish, uh, in this time, baptism was not a, a super common practice. In fact, it was reserved primarily for Gentiles who were converting from a, another way of life, a, another religion, into Judaism. Reserved for people who, wanted, who were not worshiping Yahweh, who now wanted to worship Yahweh. Why? What was it signifying? Why would Gentiles need to be baptized? What was the the picture that it was presenting to anyone who was watching? Well, baptism was basically saying, as a Gentile, I know I'm an outsider, but now I'm renouncing my former ways, and I'm going to embrace faith in the one true God, the God of Israel. It was a physical symbol, a physical statement signifying what they desired to do spiritually. To move away from worshiping false gods to moving in a new life where they would worship the one true God. Moving away from dishonoring God to honoring God with their whole life. And baptism was a picture of this, right? They would be submerged into the water, signifying a death to their old life. And they would come up out of the water as a signal that they are walking as a new person, dedicated to something different than they were before. That's that's what it meant for Gentiles to be baptized up until this point. But in Matthew 3, something surprising is happening. It's not Gentiles that are being baptized. It's Jewish people who are being baptized by the command of of John the Baptist as he prophetically speaks over them. Why would, why would they need to be baptized as Jewish people? Well, they were admitting, some of them perhaps for the first time, that their Jewishness in and of itself, their religious practice in and of itself was not enough to make them ready for God. That their bloodline was not enough to make them ready for God. They needed a different covering a different kind of blood, the blood of the Lamb of God. Baptism was always meant to signify a new way of life, a transition from a a life devoted to oneself or things not honoring the Lord to one now devoted to God himself. No wonder the Pharisees and Sadducees, as we saw last week, no wonder they were so disturbed by the actions of these Jewish people. Everything they relied upon for confidence to stand before a holy and righteous God was threatened and dismissed as not being enough. A different preparation was needed. And if all that wasn't surprising enough, Something even more surprising happens as we come to the end of Matthew chapter 3. Jesus, the promised one, the king of this new kingdom we've been talking about, comes to John the Baptist and he asks John the Baptist to baptize him. Why on earth would Jesus do that? Doesn't seem to fit, does it? That Christ would ask 
be, I would ask someone else to baptize him given what baptism is meant to signify. Jesus had nothing to renounce. Jesus had no sin to confess, and yet, He thought this action was important to take, so important, in fact, that it launches his earthly ministry. Why is it important? And why is Matthew situating it here in his gospel? Well, in this moment, in the gospel of Matthew, in the baptism of Jesus, we not only see the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see the foundation for the ministry. The baptism, the events surrounding the baptism of Jesus don't just signify the start of his ministry. And these five verses, we see why his ministry will be effective to accomplish all that we need him to accomplish for us to stand before a holy and righteous God. We will see the Son of God Stand in the place of sinners. And friends, there's no greater news than that. You want to know why? Because I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. And if we want to be with God for eternity, we need Jesus to stand in our place. Let's see how Matthew talks about this very important time and the preparation of Christ's ministry, and why it is so foundational to understanding what he will do for us, and why he uniquely is able to do it. Here's what the Word of God says. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, look, I'm the one who need to baptize you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What an interesting, complicated passage we have here. There's a lot going on in these five verses. A lot going on. Jesus joins the multitudes who have been coming out to hear John the Baptist preach, to hear his message. And he says to John the Baptist, I want you to baptize me. And I think John the Baptist has the same reaction that most of us or all of us should have if the Holy One of God comes to you and says, hey, will you baptize me? John says, Jesus, I'm not worthy to wash your feet, much less your whole body. I think this is backwards. But look at what Jesus says in verse 15. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus says, John, you're right. Now listen, we don't know how much John knew about the full nature of Jesus and what God was going to do through him, but he knew enough. He knew enough that Jesus was special, that he was better than him. And Jesus says, you're right, John. Under normal circumstances, I would be the one baptizing you. But in this moment, in the redemptive now, as we see in verse 15, I need you to do this. I need you to do this so I can launch my earthly ministry, so I can walk in the will of God the Father, and so that you, on the other side of this baptism, can understand what it is that I'm trying to do and why I am going to be able to do it. Through this act, Jesus will set the stage for his entire ministry. A ministry that will enable John's message and the repentance that came out of it to actually be effective. Because it's only through the work of Christ that righteousness can actually be achieved. Otherwise, all these confessions and all these baptisms would just be the effort of man. And all you got to do is go back to the Old Testament to see how far that will take you. No, the work of Christ will make the confession, will make the repentance effective for righteousness. Because he will give a greater baptism, not of water, but of spirit and fire, purifying us to stand before a holy and righteous 
God. So let's consider from this passage today how Christ's baptism both pictures his work and his unique ability to do it. How it's foundational, not just to start his ministry, but to understand his ministry. A very important question for us to ask as we begin our study of the Gospel of Matthew together. So firstly, how does this baptism help us understand the work of Jesus? Well, the baptism of Jesus gives us a glimpse of the greater work that Jesus will do. Again, Jesus did not need to be baptized. Who needs to be baptized? Sinners. We need to be baptized. We need to be cleansed. We are the ones who are sinful. We are the ones who need to change. We are the ones who need to prepare for the coming kingdom of God. And yet... We see Jesus being baptized here. Why? Because in this moment, Jesus is standing in our place. He's identifying with us so that he can be a substitute for us. Listen, this is what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to take the place of sinners, to identify with them and provide a means for their salvation. This is a work that was prophesied about by the prophet Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12. Here's what the word of God says. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered, hear me, numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Do you see how in Matthew chapter 3, the prophecy of Isaiah 53 begins to be fulfilled? Do you see what Christ is doing for you right now? Listen, he is being numbered among the transgressors. Is he a transgressor? No. And yet in that moment, as he stands to be baptized, he's identifying with transgressors, being counted amongst them. He will bear their iniquities, according to Isaiah 53, 11, so that they may be accounted righteous. There's nothing you can do in your own work to make yourself righteous. There's no amount of confession, no amount of, of being dipped in water that will make you righteous. But the work of God on your behalf will make you righteous. How incredible is that, friends? That because of the work of Jesus, you get something you did not deserve. Because he identifies with you, he gets a whole lot that he didn't deserve. But as a result, we get to identify with him and get more, more than we deserve. In the baptism of Jesus, we see what he will do for us. A picture, not just here, but pointing us to the cross, right? Because listen, this is not the only time that Jesus identifies with sinners, is it? The greater work is upon the cross, When it's not just a figure of death that Jesus dies, but a literal death that he dies, taking on the full weight of God's wrath on our behalf. How incredible that Jesus, the Holy One of God, stands in the place of sinners is willing to be counted among the transgressors so that you and I could find salvation. Oh, I hope you'll worship God today. Oh, I hope that you see what Jesus did for you and rejoice in that. And then, as Christ's baptism is complete, we hear the most incredible affirmation of the triune God from the testimony of John the Baptist. An affirmation that helps us understand why Jesus is able to do this work, why he's worthy to stand in the place of sinners and take on the judgment that we deserve. The baptism of Christ helps us understand why he alone is able 
to accomplish this work of salvation. In verses 16 and 17, the Bible says that immediately after Jesus was baptized, his obedience was honored by a declaration from heaven. The Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, and then God the Father spoke over him. You see the whole Trinity at work here, right? God the Spirit descending on God the Son, God the Father speaking on God the Son. See how the whole of the triune God is active in our salvation. Now, how do each of these acts show us the unique ability of Christ to accomplish the work? Why are they so important, foundational, not only to establish the work that that Jesus is about to undertake, but testify to his unique ability to do the work? Let's consider each action, each testimony on its own for a moment. Firstly, because of the the coming of the Holy Spirit, we see that Jesus is anointed to do this work. The Holy Spirit descends upon Christ like a dove. Now, what does that mean? Did Jesus not have the Holy Spirit before this moment? Well, of course not. He's God, right? He's he's the God-man. Even at this moment of baptism... He is the incarnate God being baptized. And it's necessary that he be united with the Spirit in order to maintain his deity. So the Spirit is already with Jesus. So why does the Spirit descend upon Jesus? Well, it's a declaration of anointing. It's a declaration of empowerment. That that Jesus is being uniquely empowered at this moment in this time to accomplish a unique work by Jesus. God. We see this a lot throughout the scripture, right? The Holy Spirit descends upon people for certain times to accomplish certain things. Now, in the New Testament, we're not saying that you get more of the Spirit than you already have, that you need a second kind of blessing to fill you up more with the Spirit. No, what we're saying is that there are times, there are moments where God calls servants to do specific works, and because He wants to get all the glory and honor and praise. He empowers them to do what only he can actually do. He just chooses to use us to accomplish that work. And what a picture here that we have in the baptism of Jesus that the Holy Spirit descends upon the Son. It's a a, a signal to all of us that there's something unique and different about this guy, Jesus, that he's going to be empowered to bring about the kingdom of God, that he's going to be empowered to bring about salvation in a way that no one else has ever been empowered to do. And it's the testimony of the Holy Spirit that shows us that. By the way, the Holy Spirit still does that stuff today, right? We in the church, we who are saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us immediately at salvation. And yet there are times where God calls us as his servants to do unique works and the Spirit of God will empower us to do that work. There's still an anointing work that happens today as God empowers us to do what he calls us to do in the example of Christ. So the Holy Spirit testifies that Christ is anointed to do this work, but then God the Father says that Christ is approved to do this work. That's what... The testimony of John the Baptist tells us when God says over his son, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. There's a hearkening back here to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. The testimony here is that God is saying, this is the servant I've been telling you about. And he has been approved, approved by me to accomplish this glorious work of salvation. He's the eternal son, God incarnate, who took on flesh to be our worthy substitute. He never stopped being God. He fully identified with man. And now he is going to be about a work to accomplish secure our salvation that only he could do. And God wants everyone to know, in this moment, through the testimony of John the Baptist, that I have sent him and I approve of him. It reminds me of some political 
commercials. You've seen these political commercials. We'll see them more in the coming months, I'm sure, where somebody comes on, they're giving a testimony, they're talking about the greatness of a certain candidate. And at the end of the message, what always happens, the candidate comes up and says, I approve this message, right? That's what's happening here, guys. Jesus is the greatest display of God's redemptive plan in the history of the world. And God the Father wants you to know that it's no accident that the Son of God has come, that the divine word has taken on flesh and dwelt among us. No, it was by design. And the things that he is about to do on our behalf, God approves of. Yes, I sent the word and I approve of this message. Listen, there's gonna be a lot of people in the coming weeks as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew who question Jesus. Is he really God's son? Is he really divine? Is he really able to accomplish this work? And God wants you to know before the earthly work ever began. Yes. Yes, he can. He is approved. Listen. God is pleased with his son. And that's why he can accomplish this work. He's not pleased with sinners. I hate to burst your bubble. If you're not in Christ, you may come in here thinking, you know, I've been a pretty good guy this week or a pretty good girl this week. I think God's gonna be pleased with me this week. Nope, he's not. There's any sin in you ever, and all of us are sinners. God is not pleased with you. He is pleased with his son. But listen to this. For those of us who come under the work of Christ, the pleasure that God the Father has for the God the Son will be extended to you as an adopted son or daughter. Isn't that incredible? That the pleasure that God has for the Son will be extended to us if we are in Christ. On your own, God's not pleased with you, but if you are in Christ, God is pleased with you because he's pleased with his Son. What a wonderful declaration of salvation. And over the course of Matthew, we'll see more of why the Son is pleasing to the Father. He will perfectly live for the glory of God. He will fulfill the law completely, doing what sinful man could not. And he will take our place as only he can, having been anointed and approved for this work by the design of the triune God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the triune God who has orchestrated your salvation in Christ. Friends, that is reason to worship this morning. That's incredible that in these five verses, five verses, right? We get a glimpse of the foundation of our salvation. We see a picture of the entirety of the gospel that the Son of God has identified with sinners like you and me. And as a result of him identifying with me, I get to identify with him. And so now I'm no longer a stranger, alien to the covenant of grace. I am now a child of the most high God. And if you are in Christ, that is true of you as well. And I hope you're getting chill bumps like I am because we could not have claimed that if not for the work of Christ. And in the baptism of Jesus, we get a foretaste of what he will do on our behalf. By the way, that's true of every baptism that we see, right? Because on this side of Christ, every time we see these waters stirred with the baptism, we're reminded of a greater baptism, not of water, but of the Spirit. This water didn't cleanse you. The blood of Christ does. This was a picture to the greater work that Jesus would accomplish on our behalf. Because listen, the stuff that's happening here apart from Christ would not be effective to prepare you for the day of judgment, would not be effective to prepare you for the day when you would stand before a holy and righteous God. But because of the greater work that this work points us to and the greater work that that baptism points us to, we can be ready. Isn't that what Romans 6 says? Look at Romans 6. Verses 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Listen, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. It's a commitment, guys, that we're not making in our own power. It's a commitment that we're making through the baptism of Jesus and not just this water baptism, the greater work that he accomplished for us on the cross. And because of that, we have been united, verse 5, with him in a death like his. We will be certainly united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, we have, we have died with Christ. We believe that we will reign with him. We will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This baptism was a foretaste of all that promise in Romans 6. And every time we see a baptism in these waters, it's a testimony to the fact that Jesus did it, and he's continuing to do that work in the lives of his people. we got another brother or sister who's walking in newness of life, and we are waiting for the day when Christ will return and take us home. Isn't that good? Oh, we should get some more baptisms. Because that, what a blessing, right? What a blessing that God has given us in that ordinance, just like the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So, okay, what does all this mean for us today? What is this testimony that establishes the ministry of Jesus and, and helps us understand his ability to actually accomplish all that God accomp- wants to accomplish through him? What does that mean for us today? How does Christ's faithfulness here help spur us on to faithfulness of the people of God today? Let me just offer you a couple of takeaways. Firstly, I want you to be encouraged. Oh, man, I want you to be encouraged. This is good news. A lot of bad news in the world. We talked about that. But I want you to be encouraged because God has authored your salvation in Christ. Jesus has identified with you as a sinner so that you can identify with him as a son. Praise the Lord. You could not have authored your salvation on your own. You could never have been good enough. Christ was good enough for you. He has taken our place. I want you to think about that. This morning, if you were in Jesus, God is pleased with you. Because he's pleased with his son. And you sit under the sun. Anybody need to hear that this morning? The pleasure that God has for his son, he now extends to you if you are in Christ. The God of the universe, the creator, loves you through the son. What a powerful thing. Powerful thing. I want you to be encouraged. And there's nothing more sure than that love. There's no greater foundation than that love. I don't care what happens in this world. Nothing can take that away. Rest in that, friends. Be encouraged by that. Secondly, let's follow in the example of Christ. And I'm specifically talking about baptism here. Baptism matters. It's not matter, it doesn't matter in a saving way, right? This is not a requirement for salvation. It's a testimony of salvation. But it's a public declaration to the world and to the church of the living God that there's something different about me. That I'm I'm renouncing my old way of life because it did not honor the Lord and it was leading me to a path of destruction. And now I'm going to walk in new life that is completely devoted in the empowerment of the Spirit to honoring God, awaiting the day when he will come and take me home. It may not matter to salvation, but it matters. It's not insignificant. This declaration, this public declaration through baptism, it's important for you and it's important for the church to know that something has changed and that you are walking a new life, that you are now on the Jesus team forever. I wonder if there's anybody in this room who's never been baptized. 
on, as a result of conversion. The methodology matters, being, being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism by submersion. Have you had that on the other side of your salvation in Christ? If you haven't, I would encourage you to, to see the importance of it. It was important enough that Jesus did it, even though he didn't need it. As a statement of his desire to identify with you. And now that he's identified with you, it's very important that you identify with him. Have you done that in baptism? If not, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to that later today. I want you to think about that. Christ identified with you in this baptism and the greater baptism that he took on the cross. Have you identified with him in baptism today? It's good for you and it's good for the church. Remember, as a reminder of all that God has done for us in Christ. And finally, let's seek to walk in obedience in the power of the Spirit given to us through Christ. One of the major things that we see here is the anointing of the Spirit upon Christ and the empowerment that we'll see displayed in his life as he brings about the kingdom of God over the gospel of Matthew. And as we said back then, we'll say it now, God works similarly today. Again, the moment of your salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit of God, but he all gifts us and strengthens us at certain times in our lives to do specific works for the betterment of the church and the advancement of the gospel. And the question is, if you are in Christ, are you using the empowerment that God has given you to serve his kingdom and serve his church? Are you walking faithfully in obedience in order to bring about the kingdom of God in greater ways here? Certainly that's one thing that we learn from the example of Christ here, and we will continue to learn as he walked perfectly in the Spirit as an example to us. What has God called you to do? How has God called you to serve? And what empowerment has he given you? Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Be a good steward of it for the glory of God as Jesus was. Friends, I hope you'll rejoice today. I hope you rejoice that God has saved you through his son and that he identified with you so that you can identify with him. And may it stir you to greater love for God and good works and the empowerment of the Spirit until Jesus Christ comes and takes us home. Wherever you are, would you bow your head? Spend some time before the Lord asking Him to help you know how to respond today to the preached Word of God. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you know Jesus? Have you seen how He identified with you and identified with Him? Have you ever in your life confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. A confession that led to a transformation. Renouncing your former life that did not honor God to walking in new life. If you haven't, oh, would today be the day that you would see what Christ has done for you and you would respond in faith. You can do that right where you are. Just pray to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm confessing that before you and I need a greater covering than I can provide. Would you let me step under Jesus and live a life that I was designed to live? Eternal and new life can be yours. For those of you who've already given your life to Christ, have you identified with him in baptism? Jared, I've been a Christian for 20 years. People would think it weird if I got baptized. Brother, I promise you. Sister, I promise you. The only thing we would do is celebrate because of the work that evidence is God doing in your life. It's important that as Christ identified with you, that you identify with him. Let's not keep our commitment to Christ secret. Let's go public in baptism. Amen? And finally, are you serving the cause of Christ and the empowerment of the Spirit? being obedient 
the example of Christ. What has God given you that you can use to further his kingdom? Father, would you help us as a people be faithful? Would we respond as you lead us in the spirit? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. One thing we can certainly do is worship. So let's stand and do that right now.